Welcome to the workshop on engineering new instrumentation for imaging unsealed source radiotherapy agents. Let me start by thanking Dr. Chris Kandarpa for agreeing to kick off our workshop and welcome you all to this meeting. Dr. Kandarpa is NIBIB's Director of Research Sciences and Strategic Directions and is Acting Director of our Division of Applied Science and Technology. He's taken time from his busy schedule to give you a quick overview of NIBIB and highlight the aim and goal of this workshop. Dr. Kandarpa, please. Good morning. I'd like to invite you all to the uh, workshop on engineering new instrumentation for medical image imaging unsealed sources and radiotherapy agents. I'm Chris Kandarpa, uh, Director of Research Sciences and Strategic Directions at the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. And um, I understand there are a lot of interested uh, oncology experts and uh, physical science experts and, and physicists within the audience. So welcome. Uh, these are my disclaimers. Um, this, these, these are strictly my opinion and not those of the NIH or any of the institutes and uh, nothing to disclose. I'd like to say a few things about the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. Our mission is the application of engineering principles to transform our understanding of disease, its prevention, detection, diagnosis, and treatment. We play a unique role in the NIH because we are the Technology Development Institute. We combine the sciences with technology and when they converge, we come up with the innovations that improve patient care. There are four pillars to the Institute as I defined by our director, the therapeutic devices, engineered biology, sensors and point of care and imaging technologies, all are based on a center of modeling, computation, mathematics, machine intelligence, if you will, and all towards engineering the future of health which means to personalize uh, diagnosis and treatment, extend health span, reduce costs and barriers to access. Now, as imaging experts, you know that imaging modalities are evolving. All of them are getting faster, better, safer, smaller, cheaper, and hopefully more accessible. But we need to do this and have been doing it without compromising quality and by extracting the full quantity of information within images. Quality and quantification drive the diagnostic and therapeutic precision. And we do this by looking at different tissue characteristics, as you know. One is to improve contrast, which is what we do every day. Uh, we're going to a point where we're determining composition, texture, and mechanical properties. I have several examples, but I will not go into them because of time. And the rich information content of these images provides a fodder for deep learning tasks which lead to personalized precision diagnostics and medicine. In this vein, we are constantly rethinking image acquisition and display strategies. And it's especially um, uh, nice to see the collaboration between the physicians and, and scientists in the audience. This is actually my last slide and uh, was given to me by George. He says the task that you have for the next few days is to try to go from what we did for PET imaging in transitioning from 2008 to 2020, 2020. Um, and also, although these images on the right are not of the same patient, there's clearly an increase in resolution and information. And the question is, can we accomplish similar improvements alpha, with alpha emitters as we did with positron emitters? So we're now, the, you see his image in 2016, that was clearly five years ago. And where do we go from here to improve alpha emitter images? And that is all I need to say to you and thank you and have an enjoyable two days ahead. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Jacek Kapal. I'm working for a radiation research program of NCI. I'm trying to do my best there to support and promote RPT-related research. And as you know, every one of us probably realizes by now that this type of therapy can change the outcome of patient treatment in the future. But I'm sure that in order to do that, we need to use the fully theranostic capacity of radiopharmaceuticals. It is imaging 
this imaging of radiopharmaceuticals can be used for patient selection and image-based, dosimetry-based treatment planning for each individual patient. For this, we of course need imaging, quantitative imaging. And therefore I'm so excited about this upcoming two days of discussion of the needs and possible solutions. So um, I'm really uh, glad that we have this discussion and I'm happy to welcome you here. And without further ado, I leave the stage to George Zubel, whose hard work make this meeting possible. Thank you. Thank you, Yasik, very much. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the at attendees at this workshop recognize you from the successful Wednesday uh, afternoon seminar series that you organized at the National uh, Cancer Institute uh, that covers uh, targeted radiotherapy. Uh, the once a month on a Wednesday uh, afternoon. Um, indeed, uh, many of the speakers uh, at, uh, at this workshop uh, are regular attendees and contributors uh, to that seminar series. So uh, if you are not aware of that seminar series, uh, when it comes time for a break, uh, please watch the flash slides uh, that we'll be putting up on screen. Uh, and that'll give you more information on how you can sign up uh, to uh, to attend these seminars and perhaps even uh, contribute. So it's, it's a very uh, important and interesting uh, continuing uh, education uh, that, uh, that the ASIC has, has put together and I uh, hope more of you will, uh, will join. Um, it's, I, I wanna thank the National Institutes of Health uh, and YASIC uh, for uh, co-organizing uh, and co-moderating uh, this workshop uh, and uh, look forward to uh, uh, one and a half days of uh, interesting presentations and, uh, and discussions. So the, uh, the, just quickly, the, uh, the workshop uh, is intended to bring together physicians and scientists uh, from therapy and instrumentation uh, in order to understand clinical challenges of treating uh, cancer uh, and to pose the possible technical improvements in instrumentation uh, and imaging so as to uh, improve the outcomes of cancer therapy uh, by improving uh, the dosimetry that uh, can be uh, estimated um, uh, as part of the uh, as part of the planning, uh, this is particularly interesting uh, for the emerging uh, alpha emitter uh, isotopes that are currently uh, uh, under testing and development. Uh, I, I think the challenges here are uh, more strenuous than we've seen for uh, other uh, therapies, and uh, hopefully we can come together with some uh, new ideas on how to accomplish that. Uh, session one uh, is meant to review uh, the clinical applications of therapy uh, and diagnostic imaging as it is used in, uh, in other um, applications, uh, cardiac and brain. Uh, hopefully we can gain some ideas uh, there, uh, how we can apply uh, new, new concepts to therapy. Uh, session two, uh, it looks at the development of quantitative imaging capabilities in nuclear medicine over the years uh, and looks forward to possible new improvements uh, in years to come. Uh, session three, uh, we will learn more about isotope production uh, and how dosimetry plays uh, a role in delivering safe uh, and effective uh, therapies. Uh, being engineering, uh, uh, bioengineering, uh, we at uh, NIBIB see the first uh, improvement in therapies uh, that uh, uh, could be accomplished through engineering improved methods to directly image uh, real-time therapy dose being delivered to the target cancer uh, and surrounding uh, healthy tissues. So uh, we look forward to some exciting presentations uh, and exciting uh, discussions uh, around uh, that possibility. So um, we're a little ahead of schedule, uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, but let us uh, proceed to the uh, first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Stephen Larson from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. 
uh, has um, uh, pre-recorded as all speakers uh, his presentation. He unfortunately is uh, unable uh, to attend, uh, but Dr. Sarah Cheel is um, standing by. And as you type in your questions uh, for Dr. Larson, uh, she can uh, chime back and, and hopefully uh, answer questions and uh, continue any discussions. So um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Larson's presentation on alphas as radiohaptins for pre-targeted radioimmunotherapy, PRIT. Dr. Larson. Hello, I'm Stephen Larson from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and I represent the group who has developed alpha radiohaptins for pre-targeted radioimmunotherapy, or PRIT. These are my disclaimer slides. There have been major advances in targeted radiotherapy in the last few years, from 2013 to 2021. Of course, we all know about radium-223, an alpha emitter, lutetium-177 dotatate, lutathera, NDA-approved, and now a very exciting prospect for lutetium-177 PSMA-617 via the phase three vision trial. And we know recently successful endpoints of progression-free survival and overall survival in castrate-resistant prostate cancer were achieved. I wanna point out that although what we have seen so far from targeted therapy is palliative, targeted therapy can be curative in patients. It's a matter of getting the right radiation dose to tumor and the proper therapeutic index in relationship to other normal tissues. If we can hit that sweet spot, we can cure even tumors in patients. What we need to do is have a curative tumor dose that has about 10,000 rads within the tumor, a renal dose, which is less than 1,500 rads. And that means the therapeutic index is seven to 10. A bone marrow dose is less than 150 and that means therapeutic index with respect between tumor and bone marrow of 40 to 100, and a colomucosa dose of less than 250, that is approximately 40 to 60. Today, I'm gonna to talk about alpha and beta pre-targeted radioimmunotherapy, PRIT, for cures. And I'm gonna introduce a platform with matching partners, that is a series of antibody forms targeting pediatric and adult tumors, as well as a suite of versatile radioligand especially Proteus the system, which we'll discuss later for therapy and theragnostics. Why has conventional immunoglobulin radioconjugates failed? It's simply because of the fact that the concentration of radioactivity is too slow to target tumor rapidly enough without significantly impacting normal tissues, especially blood and bone marrow, as well as other tumors, uh, other non-tumor sites that may express uh, tumor associated antigen as well. Instead, pre targeted radioimmunotherapy or PRIT has been proposed as a great way to overcome these limitations. And this, in this process, we simply separate the targeting of the antibody itself from the targeting of the radioactivity. In a sense, uh, all of the methods that are proposed so far for PRIT have an antibody that carries a kind of capture protein or capture, capture system to the tumor. And then we have a smaller molecule that more rapidly targets to the tumor for the radioactivity component. Let me show you what we mean. Variety of PRIT approaches have been proposed in the last few years. For example, using antibodies to which is attached a streptavidin moiety, you radio label a biotin, very, very high uh, binding strength in the order of 10 to the 15 liters per mole or so. In addition, radio-labeled oligonucleotides have been used where the a complementary pair of oligonucleotides is essentially radio-labeled or attached to the monoclonal antibody as shown. By specific antibodies with radio-labeled haptin in which one arm binds the radio-labeled haptin and the other arm binds the antigen tumor associated. And then a click chemistry, which is becoming more and more popular in which we use the uh, transcytooctane attached to the antibody, for example, and then a radio label uh, tetrazine, of which clicks rapidly uh, in vivo on the antibody site. We have introduced a 
variant of these methodologies, but one which has worked exceptionally well, as I think I can show you. For example, we'll show here an example of GPA33, a tumor associated an antigen commonly expressed in colon cancer for beta dotaprit, pre-targeted radiotherapy of prit, and we are shooting for cures here after intravenous use. Uh, Dane Wittrup is one of our collaborators, and Dane and his uh, colleague uh, Kelly Orcutt, uh, postdoc in his lab, deserve a great deal of credit for developing this methodology. Uh, it uses an antibody form that has a haptin binding domain called CA25 that will capture the radiohaptin injected and then tumor associated antigen. There is a small radiohaptin which is DOTA based and contains a metal ion, and the radiohaptin capture system is an antibody itself, but very high affinity for the lanthanides, yttrium, and lutetium, as we'll see. So you give this in steps. First, you give the bispecific antibody, which contains both the antibody uh, antigen specificity and also the radiohaptin capture system. And then the second is a haptin dextron clearing agent. It's usually to, used sometime after there's an equilibrium achieved with the, with the, between the antibody and the tumor. And then, and only then, and usually this is at 24 to 48 hours after injection of the antibody, you give the, uh, the radiohaptin itself. And what happens is you get localization of the antibody form to the tumor. You clear away any unreacted antibody and it all goes into the liver, uh, being captured by the usual sort of Ashwell receptors. And then you give the radioactivity and it rapidly targets to the tumor at the, at the radiohaptin binding site, or it's secreted through the kidneys. That's the idea and it works well. This is the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which has been developing these. Nikon Chung has provided the antibodies. The, my group in the Larson lab has provided radiohaptins. These are two of our key personnel, a radiochemist, Sarah Chio, and also a senior scientist, expert in antibodies, Hong Su. This is a typical uh, study that we have, which showed that you could actually achieve cures with minimal toxicity to the animals. Here we see, for example, in the treated group, long-term complete responses, but also when we looked at these animals at necropsy 140 days later, there was no evidence of tumor. And also we found that there was very little toxicity. We examined for bone marrow hypocellularity, renal damage, and we looked at uh, problems of CBCs and blood chemistry abnormalities, and we saw no significant changes. This is because of the therapeutic index we achieved in this work. Therapeutic index was approximately 100 or so. Tumor dosing was able to achieve 14,000 rads, and dose to the kidney was only approximately 875 rads uh, with therapeutic index of 16. So we could achieve cures in new mice bearing human xenografts of colon cancer with no observed radiotoxicity. This is a modular theranostic with therapeutic indexes for tumor to blood up to 120, with tumor to kidney up to, up to 20. And this platform approach we've shown uh, in, in work, which I'm not going to cite today, for GD2, HER2, as well as GPA33, uh, has works very effectively. I'm going to talk today about a Proteus radiohaptin series, which we've adapted for alpha work. This is the team which has largely done this. This is a radiochemist who's the leader of the team, Mike McDivitt, who is an expert on alphas, Darren Beach, who's a medicinal chemist, and Watar Orfili, who's who is an organic chemistry chemist, has made a number of the radiohaptins. This is the classic radiohaptin that we use, aminobenzyl dota. And both of these have identical pharmacology, even though they contain a different radio metal in the binding pocket. And this binds to the radiohaptin capture site on the antibody. And this is because they have identical affinity, approximately 10 picomoles or so for that binding reaction. Again, as we said, developed by Orcutt at, in, at, uh, at MIT. Here's an example of how this looks in practice with uh, yttrium 86, for example, and also with a lute the lutetium dota. And we can see that the degree of uptake is essentially identical between the two uh, tracers. And you can see outstanding contrast between the tumor uptake here and the background, which is uh, very low. So you see most of the uptake is in the tumors expected. 
So we have a complementarity of bispecific antibodies that target tumor and radiohaptins for pre-targeted immunotherapy. Now, Proteus is the name for a generic system that we have used to exploit the versatility of radionuclides for PRIP. It's a suite of, of radioactive forms for therapy, for alpha, beta minus, beta plus, diagnosis with gamma and, and positron emission, and also theranostics. David Scheinberg from Memorial Sloan Kettering has been a pioneer in the use of actinium-225, which is the alpha that we have used most prominently. And this shows why alphas are valuable in the context of CRIT and targeted therapy. You see the, the beta form binds to a tumor site, but then there is a rather long path length for the beta. And although a lot of radiation is, is administered to the tumor, there's also quite a lot to normal tissue. Whereas alphas have the property that they have high linear energy transfer with a relatively short range. Uh, so the print with alpha emitters has with this LET, there's a graph of LET here, which shows the amount of KB, KEV per micrometer of tissue and path length. You can see alphas are the best, the highest, compared, for example, to the uh, relatively low absorption uh, of uh, X-rays and even beta rays, but the alphas are very high. And what they do is the alphas disrupt, break both uh, pairs uh, uh, of DNA, which is very hard to re repair this double strand, strand break. So they have a high LET, a high uh, radiobiologic effectiveness, and more likely to cause double strand break. Another side effect that's beneficial is that they have very little impact, the alphas, uh, from oxygen, low oxygen environment. So they have a low um, OER. There are several promising alpha emitter series. The one we focus on is over here in this quadrant. It, you see that actinium-225 actually decays through four alpha emitting isotopes, uh, francium, uh, astatine, and and uh, bismuth-213 uh, during this cascade, which releases a large amount of radiation. In fact, if you target actinium actinium-225, what you actually target is a generator system that will achieve a secular equilibrium with all uh, th three of its daughters. But this is also a problem. And if you have, for example, long circulation of the actinium, you will create these daughters, which have the ability to break the bond that captures the actinium-225 to the chelate. And they will circulate independently, and especially the bismuth-213 will target kidneys. So alpha therapy with dota prit for us is right now act actinium uh, proteus, actinium-225 proteus. Once again, remember we have a, a, a radio metal which targets a bispecific site on the antibody. That's our concept. Now we want to capture this, this ability to bind selectively to the binding site, but we want to be able to carry actinium. How can we do this? This, this uh, radiohaptin capture antibody is called uh, humanized CA25. It was modified from the original form that was developed by Wittrup's group by Nikong Chung, my collaborator. It only binds lutetium and yttrium with really low picomolar uh, affinity of the common radio metals. It ignores the pre TOTA, this uh, radiohaptin. That, that's a blessing, but it also could be a curse. So, in order to target actinium and other alphas, pet isotopes, other betas, we must have a different system. And this is what we have settled on. It's called a SOAT Proteus system. It's an ultra high affinity CA25 uh, platform here in this end, which we call the affinity handle. And then it is a pegylation string, in this case, four pegs, connecting to a, a three member DOTA, which is not susceptible to binding by the antibody, but which does bind a number of radionuclides, such as indium, lead, actinium 225, and 177. And for example, when we use this in a, in a similar system to what we've talked about uh, before, the colon system, you see with uh, that we can actually cure animals with, and you see here that the 10 of 10 had long-term survival and they also had complete response with uh, a double dose of the actinium uh, proteus system. This was with HER2, Theranostics, we can use also for pre-targeted radiotherapy. There is a difficulty in imaging the alphas usually because you don't give a large amount and then there are multiple, they mostly are uh, gamma emission. There's a few gamma emission, but it's a complex problem. 
we need a theranostic drug with intrinsic diagnostic and therapeutic properties that will allow us to image uh, the, the theranostic and then impute the dose to from the therapy. For example, IM-24 and IM-31 are good examples of this. <clears throat> the theranostic radioactive drugs, there's natural theranostics that have both diagnostic and therapeutic properties. There's radioisotopic therapeutic pairs. And what I'm gonna talk about is surrogate. What we've done is we've used indium proteus and actinium proteus. And because they bind through the same affinity handle, which in this case is right here, they have essentially the identical uptake properties and distribution. For example, here we see comparison of the actinium and the indium and within experimental error, they have the same uptake in tumor and virtually no uptake in the other tissues at 24 hours post injection. And the indium can be imaged, of course, in this case, we see SPECT. This is the postdoc Edward Fung who developed this methodology. And you can see that there's beautiful images. You can quantitate it and relate it back to the amount of actinium that would be targeted also into the same, same tumor. We have had to work out the relationship between the stoichiometry of the radiohaptin and also the concentration of the antibody injected. And this is what you see that on this axis, as you give higher and higher picomoles of the antibody, you get a saturation effect. This is in a SW1222 colon. The percent uptake in terms of dose per, per gram follows a different profile. You have you begin to, as you get begin to get into saturation effects, you begin to see a relative drop off uh, of the fractional activity on the tumor. And this phase of the curve gives unnecessary radiation to normal tissues like kidneys. So you want to optimize where you are imaging. <clears throat> We've done a number of uh, studies. This is with an intravenous system where you get excellent targeting to flank xenografts. This happens to be a breast model with the HER2 alpha crit. Uh, you see that we've exploded this so that you can look at all this, the uptake in other tissues. It's all less than 1%. So that ratios are high. And in this system, you see prolonged uh, progression free or survival in these, in these animals uh, with the, in the treatment group, either with one or two uh, doses of the HER2 alpha dota crit, and then the targeting of the actinium proteus. Here's another example where we give our doses IP. So on day zero, we inject antibody into the peritoneum. On day 19 to 20, after there's been growth, uh, we, we, we inject, we first inject cells, then we inject antibody, then we inject a clearing agent to clear away any unreacted antibody, and then we give radioactivity. And as you can see, it's very effective. For example, you have prolonged progression-free survival out to 150 days in the treated groups. Uh, as you can see here, uh, with with one cycle versus two cycle being more effective, and also toxicity is minimal to moderate tubular degenerative disease in the kidneys, very mild toxicity. So, alpha dota print is safe and effective for treatment in breast cancer. There's cures. Future uh, bifunctional antibodies will be used with other radioactive innovations. So in conclusion, I just want to say that modular theranostic dotaprit uh, is, uh, is possible. We use a platform approach which has targets for most human tumors. We've shown three separate uh, systems that work extremely well with good therapeutic index with, associated with cures. The known stereo specificity of the very, very high uh, 10 to 20 picomolar affinity and the knowledge of specific activity is what has allowed us to achieve of this progress. We're supported by a number of grants, both uh, federal and, and uh, also from Memorial Sloan Kettering. These are a couple of important papers that came out recently on this topic. Uh, this is the group that has done all the work. I want to thank you very much for your attention. We'd like to thank Dr. Larson for his excellent overview of uh, the th the uh, therapies that he has implemented at uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, and in uh, many ways has led the way uh, the way in uh, new developments uh, for such therapies. 
Um, as mentioned, uh, Dr. Larson is not available to answer your questions uh, uh, real time, but as mentioned, uh, Dr. Cheel will be available uh, during the panel discussion. So um, just because Dr. Larson is not here, uh, do not hold back on uh, typing in questions. Um, we will assemble those and um, get to answer them after uh, the, uh, the speakers of this session. Um, also, if you you are a uh, non-speaker panelist. Speakers are uh, panelists by default. Uh, if you are invited to be a panelist, uh, please uh, stand ready before the uh, panel discussion at uh, 1255. We would like to uh, give you a chance to quickly introduce yourself, uh, tell people where you're from, uh, and uh, help with the panel discussions that um, will be going on uh, after this session. Uh, is is finished. Um, so uh, with that, le let me proceed to uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. John John Hum. Um, will be presenting on current status of imaging and dosimetry of alpha emitting radionuclides. Uh, Dr. Hum uh, is also from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Hum, please. Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank George Zubol and the organizers of this NIBIB conference for inviting me to give this presentation today on the title of Current Status of Imaging and Dosimetry of Alpha Emitting Radionuclides. I have no financial disclosures with any companies at this time. The content of my talk is as follows. First, alpha emitters for targeted radionuclide therapy. Why are there so few choices? Trying to image alpha emitters, trying to determine the fate of any radioactive progeny, challenges of alpha particle dosimetry with today's radionuclides, and then to conclude possible ways forward. So why is there a limited number of choices of alpha emitting radionuclides for targeted therapy? applications. This slide shows the periodic table on the left and the familiar plot of the line of isotope stability on the right in which proton number is plotted against neutron number. For small atoms, the stable isotopes have equal numbers of protons and neutrons and lie on a 45 degree slope. But as the elements get heavier, more neutrons are required to hold the nucleus together against the increasing Coulomb repulsive forces. Note that the radioactive decay for practically all elements below lead, with a Z of 82, is by either beta minus, depicted by the blue squares, representing a neutron excess, or beta plus, depicted by the orange, representing a proton excess. The thin black line in the middle represents the small number of stable isotopes. Only for the heaviest elements, bismuth and above, does alpha emission become the preferred mode of decay, represented by the yellow boxes in the right-hand figure. Whereas there are numerous alpha emitting radionuclides, only those elements with an atomic number two above bismuth can result in non-radioactive alpha emitting daughters. This is because an alpha decay results in a change in atomic number of two. So bismuth, polonium, or astatine, as you can see in the delineated boxes, could decay to stable daughters of thallium, lead, or bismuth, respectively. But anything higher will inevitably decay to an alpha-emitting prodigy. In spite of this complication, scientists and companies have sought to actively consider radionuclides that result in alpha emitting decay chains. The three most common of which are radium that resulted in an FDA approve, approved product, Zofigo, actinium-225, and thorium-227. So for convenience, alpha emitters can be classified into two groups, simple, those that decay to stable or non-alpha emitting daughters, for which there are, is a very small number of choices, and complex, which are those that have radioactive alpha emitting daughters. 
The first alpha-aminted to be used with a tumor-targeting molecule is this study by Dave Scheinberg, Steve Larson, George Scorus, and others, in which a leukemia-targeting antibody, M195, was tagged with bismuth-213. Its 46-minute half-life is too short for most applications, but if it can be used, it has the advantage that if you image for greater than 60 minutes, you capture greater than 50% of the total number of decays. Under these circumstances, the image approximates the cumulative activity and hence the absorbed dose distribution in the patient. But as you can see, even with a 10 millicurie or 370 megabecquerel injection, the low yield of gammas and their high 440 kV energy produces poor quality images. This is in part because gamma cameras are not designed, where here I'm referring to crystal thickness, collimators, et cetera, for imaging such isotopes. Now that may change now that a need has been identified. Astatine 211 is possibly the best alpha emitter that does not exhibit problematic daughters. It has a 7.2 hour half-life and an abundance of characteristic X-rays in the 77 to 92 kV range, suitable for imaging. It has a real potential if the problems of its challenging radiochemistry can be solved. Clinical theragnostic studies have been performed with astatine at Duke with an antitanasian antibody directed at brain tumors and by the Gothenburg group in Sweden who used astatine MX35 antibodies to treat intraperitoneal metastatic ovarian cancer. And this results in images in both studies suitable for dosimetry. Returning to bismuth 213, to overcome the limitations with the short 46 minute half-life, Dave Scheinberg and colleagues decided rather than milk the actinium-225 generator, why not attach that generator onto a targeting molecule? The question this raises is, can we image actinium-225? There are three major challenges. First, actinium itself emits a very low yield of predominantly low energy photons that are inadequate for clinical imaging, and therefore we must deduce the location of actinium from its first daughter, francium-211. Second, because of its long 10-day half-life, and because each decay results in the emission of four alphas from this decay chain, the potential dose per unit of minutes of activity is 1,000-fold higher than that of bismuth 213, meaning that the administered activities need to be commensurately smaller, i.e. in the millicurie range rather than in the millicurie range, making the imaging of therapy doses especially difficult. And third, since the recall energy is so high from alpha emission, about 100 kV, the progeny are released from the targeting construct and the fate of this progeny could result in unanticipated toxicity. The Heidelberg group has reported some sensational responses to actinium uh, PSMA 617, which has energized the study of alpha emitters as exemplified in this published work by Kratokville. The supplementary data in this paper provides an actinium 225 image. Here it is overlaid here. And you can see that this image was obtained with 10 megabecquerels or 270 microcurie, and it provides the example of the diagnostic quality that we might expect. The authors note that the diagnostic quality may be inadequate for dosimetry applications. A big concern of actinium is the fate of the daughters, especially the final daughter, bismuth 213, because bismuth has the possibility to translocate to the kidney, a dose-limiting organ. Jasmine Schwartz in my group conducted a preclinical study to determine the magnitude of this translocation resulting from an injection of actinium-labeled M195 antibody in non-tumor-bearing mice. The measurement performed consisted of excising the kidneys and rapidly counting them on a high-purity uh, germanium detector, shown on the left. Under equilibrium conditions, the spectrum on the left shows that the francium peak is of similar height to the bismuth 213. However, if you look at the right-hand spectrum of the kidney, 
you can see that the bismuth peak is three times higher than that of the Franstium, suggesting that a significant bismuth translocation has occurred from the decay of actinium radio labeled antibodies to the kidney. This is perhaps a consequence of the long residence time of radio labeled antibodies in the bloodstream, but serves as an important caution for us in the field. Transitioning now to radium 223, which is approved as Zofigo. As part of a phase one trial performed at MSKCC prior to FDA approval, Jorge Carrasquillo and his team acquired static and whole body images from clinical radium therapies. Like for actinium, the low counts results in poor quality images. For comparison, the left-hand image shows a technesium bone scan of the same patient. Note, whereas it's possible to see the lesions on the right-hand radium scans, the image contrast is far poorer. Now, we also tried to, since one of the daughters of radium actually is bismuth, we tried in this study to image, but could not actually get any measurable signal in a window corresponding to bismuth. So we think this is because radium exits the bloodstream very rapidly, uh, either being deposited into a bone or entering the gut within minutes post-administration. There is great interest in thorium-227, the parent of radium-223. This stems from the fact, the fact that thorium-labeled antibody can target soft tissue disease. And when it decays, the radium decay project product can target disease metastatic to bone. There are ongoing clinical trials led by Nida Panditaska at MSK that include imaging of thorium. The spectrum at the top right-hand side um, was taken from a study from a publication from the Royal Marsden, and it shows in the uh, red and the blue characteristic energy emission energies or photo peaks from radium and thorium respectively. Below, we see two images of a patient at Memorial showing an image acquired in the thorium window, and on the right-hand side, one in the radium. You can see that it's difficult to, to really identify much difference, but you can see that there is slightly more uh, activity in, in the radium image in the gut and in the bone, which we can infer we know this from the Algida study that we had before. So this slide shows the problem we face when attempting to perform dosimetry for alpha emitting radionuclides. If the resolution of current gamma cameras is of the order of 10 millimeters, then the photons we image to model the distribution of the non-penetrating radiation for dosimetry purposes may be adequate for long range beta emitters like yttrium 90 shown on the left. For lutetium 177 with just a 1.9 millimeter maximum beta range in tissue, the beta, particle, the beta particle ranges are already smaller than the standard gamma camera image pixel size, meaning that dose non-uniformity under will be undersampled by images from these agents. But when we get to alpha sources, then we can conjecture that the images, whereas they can provide general organ distribution and with repeat imaging, some tissue pharmacokinetic data, they cannot provide accurate information at the relevant cellular target level for microdosimetry. For alpha emitters, it may be necessary to obtain data at the microscopic histologic level if we are truly to understand the tumor response or radionuclide toxicities from alpha emitting agents. How do we get this? We could obtain sample data from image guided biopsy specimens exposed to autoradiographic detectors where possible. We are doing this at MSKCC for PET tracers already, as this example shows, but we have not yet done this with alpha emitting radionuclides for patients. Here is an example of a preclinical study using actinium-225 from Sarah Cheel and Steve Larson, acquired with an ionizing radiation quantum imaging detector built by Brian Miller. This instrument can detect alpha particles directly and could be used to analyze clinical specimens to reveal the extent of non-uniformity of the source distribution. 
to conclude, the major problems of alpha emitters for clinical radionuclide dosimetry are, one, low image count statistics resulting in poor activity quantification, two, inadequate image spatial resolution to determine the source microdistribution, and three, inadequate energy resolution to accurately determine the location of the progeny. So I have three final concluding slides. Rosh Mitline in my group is an image processing and reconstruction expert who provided me with his efforts to denoise and recover the signal for parallel and opposed planar images. Here, actinium sources of different sizes are simulated in a phantom one quarter of the way from the posterior head. On the left, you see the raw, anterior, and posterior images. In the top middle is the geometric mean image, and below it, you see Ross's sparse representation regularization method that recovers a more accurate estimate of the true reference shown in the bottom right. So there is promise of improvements in this space. Two, overcoming poor spatial resolution. If dosimetry is used to predict tumor and tissue response, then for alpha emitters, we need to supplement gamma camera image data with information of the tumor microdistribution. Such information might be obtained from mid-treatment patient biopsy samples, extrapolated from preclinical measurements, or indirectly obtained from compartmental analysis if count statistics allow, or through the use of a PET radionuclide surrogate of actinium, such as um, uh, lanthium-132, an actinium analog recently proposed by the Wisconsin group. And finally, determining the fate of the progeny. Multi-windows acquisitions can provide information to separate the parent from progeny. Cameras with better energy resolution to facilitate a cleaner separation between isotope peaks are under development. I believe Lars Florenlid will be speaking more about this in his presentation later in the, com in the conference. And here I conclude my talk. Thank you. Uh, th Thank you, Dr. Hum, for that very interesting um, uh, presentation. Uh, I particularly thank you for the uh, poor image that you showed uh, towards the beginning of your presentation. Uh, that speaks directly to, to the challenge uh, that uh, we are confronted in uh, this uh, workshop uh, to see if we can uh, over overcome uh, the, the quality of the er images that are currently uh, available. Um, I, I'm waiting to hear from uh, Yasik, who is uh, manning the Q&A. Um, Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any questions directly uh, related okay. to this talk, but, but I, I have one though. Um, it's of course very exciting, but what do you think when this approach can be routinely used in the clinic to imaging um, alpha emitters? That, that, that's a really good question, Yatsek. I, I think right now, many of the pharmaceutical companies that are uh, running trials are only, require, are only doing imaging during the experimental phase. And I think when these agents get approved, they're, they're choosing a pathway that is to not involve imaging, but to give the, uh, the radionuclide uh, conjugate just simply like a chemotherapeutic agent. And that worries me for the reason that as, uh, as you and as George had said, if we want to personalize these treatments, we are gonna have to consider individualized biodistributions uh, that can lead also to dosimetry. So I am worried about that, but I, but I think uh, in order, what we have to do is we have to get image qualities and uh, quantification that can be meaningful that will allow us to be able to persuade industry to, um, you know, to actually conduct imaging and dosimetry in clinical trials that involve alpha emitters. Yeah, so that's what this meeting is all about. We indicate the things that we need to do. I have a question from Dan Thorek. Uh, he complimented the talk and then he said, uh, ask you to comment a little bit about the Bismuth, Bismuth um, 230 and, uh, oh. 230. Uh, to that 13, sorry, images uh, utilized for dosimetry yeah. purposes. I, I think organs. that's a good question. Thanks, Dan, for that. 
uh, the, the, the bismuth 213, I think, becomes relevant in some of the work, which is what Sarah Cheel and Dave Scheinberg, uh, Dave Scheinberg, sorry, uh, Steve Larson, which is the pre-targeting, where you actually have very rapid uh, accumulation of radionuclide targeting agents. Uh, and so therefore, uh, and you also have a, a high energy photon that can be imaged. I think it, it would be nice to hear later on during the second session, when we talk about gamma cameras, gamma cameras that are designed and optimized for the high energy gamma photons that are emitted by bismuth 213. Does that answer your question, Dan? You'll have, to, you'll have to text type quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, actually, uh, I, I have a, 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 a kind of a similar question uh, or associated question. I believe in one of your previous talks uh, uh, earlier, I think last year, you mentioned that uh, to acquire some of the images that you have of the alpha emitters, you had to invite an engineer from the manufacturing company right. yes, to yes. come in and make it possible. Right. Uh, could you give us a little anecdotal okay. information about uh, what right. they needed to do, uh, how yes. well it worked after they did um, it? Uh, what, when what when the that? very first Bismuth 213 trial was conducted, uh, George Scorus and I at that time, we had uh, th th this was now about, when was this actually done? This was done now around 1999. So in those days, we had ADAC uh, uh, gamma cameras, at those Pegasus gamma cameras, and uh, you couldn't, the, the highest you could actually image was up to about 420 or so. Or, um, uh, so what happened is actually, we had to change the high voltage so that we could actually uh, acquire and actually get the photo peak on the P-scope in order to be able to image such high energies. So that means we had to call the, one of the ADAC engineers in for each time we had a patient and adjust the high voltage to, to, in order to see actually the 440 peak. Uh, I think now with the, with, with more, the more uh, recent gamma cameras, you can image up to 440 on the latest uh, uh, Siemens and, um, uh, and GE systems. Uh, but but that's again something that I think also the collimators, as you could see in that time, even with high energy H, even with the high energy high resolution collimators, they they were really designed those collimators for imaging I one three one, which has a three sixty seven kV. So they were really not you know that, so there's a lot of septal penetration as you can see. There may be ways to overcome this through modeling, and I'm sure we're going to hear from uh, uh, from Ben uh, Ben Cho and from. Uh, Eric Frey and from others later on, how one can maybe overcome those problems. So we have two more questions, but I think because of the limit of time, I suggest that we uh, ask them during the panel session. Okay, thank okay. you very yeah. much. I will thank now you. return to mute. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's go on to the, uh, the next talk by uh, Dr. Daniel Prima of the University of Pennsylvania. He will uh, talk to us about MIBG clinical therapy practices, the role of imaging iodine-131. Dr. Prima, please. Hello, thank you very much. It's really an honor and a privilege to present to you about MIBG clinical therapy practices and the role of imaging I-131. My name is Dan Prima and I'm the Chief of Nuclear Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Here are my disclosures. And so MIBG or meta iodobenzyl guanidine is not a new radiopharmaceutical. It was first published in 1980, but its first therapeutic FDA approval was not until 2018 for a high specific activity formulation. And here's an image of the Abramson Cancer Center celebrating the FDA approval um, back in those exciting days when we could actually be in a large group um, unmasked and less than six feet apart. So hopefully we're very close to those days again. Um, it's, it's nice nostalgia to see. And here's the chemical structure of MIBG. We see the iodine in the meta position where it's very stable. The vast majority of it is excreted intact in the urine. It is a guanethidine analog and a substrate for the norepinephrine transporter. And so very many neuroendocrine tumors overexpress norepinephrine transporters. They are used to reuptake catecholamines that have been released. And interestingly, even cells that don't release catecholamines very often overexpress the norepinephrine transporter. So 
patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma that do not have catecholamine overexpression or ones that derive from parasympathetic nervous system can still express it. And even a lot of non-catecholaminergic um, cell line derived neuroendocrine tumors do overexpress the norepinephrine transporter. And so MIBG can be a target in those patients. And we determine who is and who is not a candidate for therapy with MIBG using MIBG imaging. And typically the diagnostic imaging currently, um, the standard is I-123 MIBG using a combination of planar imaging and spec CT. There are several PET agents in development, but generally speaking, most of the time we make decisions about whether or not a patient should be treated with MIBG based on I-123 MIBG imaging. And here's an example of a patient with a paraganglioma. The primary is in the mid abdomen, just below the liver. And then there are several bone metastases scattered and you can, and retroperitoneal disease as well. And so this patient would be a good candidate for therapy, but this doesn't tell you anything about the kinetics of the MIBG through the patient's uh, tumors and normal tissues. And so that brings us to a really fundamental difference of diagnostics versus theranostic agents. So typically good diagnostic agents can achieve a very high tumor to non-tumor contrast at the time of imaging. And so you find something that has a high contrast at some point and you figure out when is that point in most patients and typically that's when you're gonna try to image. And you don't really care what happens before or after that. And really an ideal diagnostic agent is something that achieves high contrast early and then washes out of the body very quickly so that the radiation dose to the patient is as low as it can be. So typically we focus for diagnostic agents on things with relatively short physical half-lives and fast kinetics, but a good therapeutic agent can achieve a high cumulative tumor to non-tumor ratio. So you don't really care very much what is the contrast at any point in time, as long as the overall, the tumor gets significantly higher radiation dose than the normal tissues, and then you can get a therapeutic ratio and use that as a therapeutic. And very often this is achieved by a high and long retention within sites of tumor and more rapid kinetics in sites of non-tumor. And in order to really understand that quantitatively, you really do need to measure the retention at later time points in order to calculate accurate dosimetry. And so theranostic uses really require the tail of the curve. And that's often difficult to achieve with shorter lived diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals. And to show this graphically, I had to borrow from friends and colleagues who uh, you just heard from Drs. Larson and Hom from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I couldn't have created an image that shows my point quite so readily. You have two patients here with metastatic thyroid cancer who underwent I-124 PET imaging. And while these images look similar, you can see from the y-axis that the overall uptake is significantly higher in the first patient and the second patient. But at that initial imaging time point, there's certainly overlap. There are lesions here that have as much uptake as some of the lesions here. But what's incredibly striking is what happens days two, three, and five. The washout here is incredibly fast. So even though you can see a lot of activity here and you might say it looks exactly the same as um, the uptake in some of the lower lesions in example one, by day two and by day three, it changes very much. So even though the diagnostic quality of these scans is equally good at those early time points, the contrast tumor to non-tumor is pretty striking and you can see all the sites of disease. When you actually measure the area under the curve to try to extrapolate what would be the radiation dose to the patient from a therapeutic amount, it's really, you can see very quickly that those early, the early contrast washes out very quickly and you're not gonna get a significant therapeutic benefit. So if you have a short-lived isotope, a short-lived diagnostic, you may not be able to accurately predict which patients are gonna benefit from therapy. Based on the day one imaging in these two patients, you can predict that they'll both respond to therapy 
Um, and you may be right in one case and wrong in the other. And so that brings us to MIBG therapy. The um, regimen that's been FDA approved is a high specific activity formulation. Um, we typically prescribe according to the package insert, eight millicuries per kilo up to a maximum of 500 millicuries. And we expect to give two cycles of therapy at least 90 days apart. But what's interesting is the dose is capped by dosimetry derived organ limits. And to my knowledge, this is the first and only therapeutic radiopharmaceutical FDA approved based on organ dosimetry um, limits. There have been others based on whole body limits. And the dosimetry scans are relatively straightforward. Patients get thyroid blockade. You could see in that earlier image of I-123-MIBG some off-target accumulation in the thyroid gland, which we try to minimize with blockade. Patients are given a lower non-therapeutic administered activity of five to six millicuries of high specific activity I-131-MIBG at at least 50 kilograms, um, and then weight-based dosing for our smaller and younger patients. And the patients undergo three scans. And typically, according to the package insert, they're planar scans, one done immediately within one hour and prior to the patient voiding, and then days one to two, and days two to five with the patient voiding immediately before the scan. And this is an example of the output from those dosimetry scans. And you can see in contrast to that patient two example a couple of slides ago, this patient, you see increasing contrast over time. And so this is a patient where when you compare the curve of the tumor to the non-tumor, uh, the tumor is accumulating over time, whereas non-tumor tissues are decreasing, and that's why the contrast continues to improve over time. And getting those measurements is incredibly important at those late time points to calculate the terminal doses both to tumors, but more importantly, to the normal tissues. And then panel D is a post-therapy scan that shows this is imaging the therapeutic dose itself after the patient was cleared from radiation safety precautions and discharged. And you can see here that there's still additional information that you can gain from a uh, imaging the therapeutic dose just by virtue of the fact that you've started with such a higher administered activity and you can wait longer for clearance from background tissues that the contrast continues to improve. And you can see areas of disease that are not readily apparent even on those diagnostic scans. So the output that we get from these dosimetry procedures are whole body and organ doses. We use CT to um, measure organ volumes in order to try to get as accurate an organ dose as possible. And if the cumulative prescribed activity that eight millicuries per kilo up to a maximum of 500 millicuries times two, so 16 millicuries per kilo up to a maximum of one curie, exceeds the pre, uh, predefined dose limits to the organs, and usually the kidneys are the limiting factor. Although in patients with pulmonary metastatic disease or long retention times, we've seen patients where the lung exposure is the limiting factor. You can decrease your dose in order to try to avoid dose limiting toxicity in terms of renal failure or radiation pneumonitis. And there are some challenges with this. First of all, dosimetry image acquisition requires several visits to the imaging center. Um, we do three scans total, including the one on the day of administration. There is a lot of interesting work being done to try to distill that down to fewer visits. And I think you'll hear about that over this conference um, where you may be able to use population inputs and things you know about the kinetics in a typical patient to fit some later time point to some and be able to make a, a fairly accurate back projection to the kinetics that led to that point and to predict forward. And, but most of the time, those fewer visits will still require a late time point and may require only a late time point. And so still having an optimized agent that has a half-life matching the therapeutic readily, um, I-131 being one of those, is really important. Having said that, planar dosimetry alone has relatively poor accuracy and precision. So I think we, we certainly learned from it um, and we can keep ourselves out of trouble somewhat. 
but the difference between a therapeutic dose that doesn't cause toxicity and a therapeutic dose that does cause toxicity may be smaller in some cases than the limits of the accuracy and precision of the technique. So we're dealing with relatively narrow therapeutic windows here and improving upon that is super important. You certainly can augment that with spec CT and it can be achieved with I-131 um, in order to improve the accuracy and precision. Most often this is done with a hybrid technique where you can use typically one spec CT acquisition and then accompany that with a planar acquisition at the same time. And then you can use planar acquisitions at other time points and still benefit from the improved accuracy and precision of the spec CT. I think PET CT quantification is certainly superior to what can be achieved even in the best case with single photon. Um, having said that, there are significant challenges to getting PET agents that are good theranostic agents um, because most of them typically have shorter half-lives. The longer lived ones have um, significant challenges in terms of positron abundance and things like that. And so it's not is entirely straightforward. And so I think it is um, reasonable to try to optimize uh, single photon dosimetry as much as possible. And while the image acquisition is pretty straightforward, the analysis is fairly complex. And it certainly requires expertise and resources that may not be available at every site um, in terms of really qualified and well-trained medical physicists. And it's, it's really a unique expertise, even in the medical physics world, where many medical physicists are either experts in diagnostic imaging or experts in external beam radiotherapy. And um, it's really important to have someone who's an expert in therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. This is getting a little bit easier as validated software packages become more readily available to simplify and increase accessibility to sites. Um, things that just really make it a lot easier. And I just wanted to highlight something that I'm guessing you'll hear from um, Eric Fry or Uni Duarja over the course of this conference about the SNMMI dosimetry challenge, which related to lutetium 177 rather than I-131, but is a really cool um, attempt to really try to understand how, how widespread are these capabilities and, and what is the delta in terms of measurements done at various different sites. So I encourage you to, to learn more about that. And so I think this is certainly improving. And so to wrap up, diagnostic imaging and theranostic imaging really do have fundamentally different goals. And a superior diagnostic agent is often a very inferior theranostic agent. And so we can't assume that just because something works really well as a diagnostic, it's going to answer critically important theranostic questions. And accurate dosimetry really does require a clear understanding of the late kinetics, which we often can't get with those optimized diagnostic agents that typically are designed to have relatively rapid washout and or a short half-life. And so this can be achieved with I-131 imaging with some limitations in terms of accuracy and precision, but often made up for in terms of the availability and accessibility. And as we increase those hybrid techniques, utilizing SPECT CT to augment the accuracy and precision, that can further improve. And I'll be happy to discuss further in the wrap up session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pima, for that interesting presentation. Uh, I just have a quick correction. I think I may have, uh, I misspoke earlier uh, when I said that questions can be typed into the chat box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there is actually a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, for typing in your questions uh, so that we can keep track of them uh, and answer them uh, either right away or uh, when we start the panel discussion uh, at the end of um, at the end of this session. So Dan, um, that's great talk as usual, but I have a question regarding the normal tissue, because we can, you know, when we do treatment planning, you want to know the efficacy, the, the effects of normal tissues. Do you think that in this field that you presented, uh, are the um, 
those relation to the normal tissue problems uh, solve? Do you have any response or where, where are you heading with this? What is needed to be done? The short answer is no, I don't think it's solved. I think we've gotten a lot better at being able to generate reproducible estimates of dose. But I think when we try to <clears throat> correspond those to the dose limits we have from external beam, that there's really, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship and it's probably a nonlinear relationship. And the most frequently cited organ limits from a mommy in 1991 are just not sufficient for this. So I, I do think we really need rigorous dose finding studies without any preconceived notions of what are the dose limits, especially um, with, with respect to renal toxicity. I think the lutetium dotate experience has shown us that there are many published examples of patients who get double or triple what we think is the dose limit and their kidneys work just fine. Um, right. and, and so I think it is obviously for acute toxicities, it's much easier to track. Um, it's a little bit harder when you have late radiation toxicity and, and when are you comfortable that you haven't caused it, um, especially in patients with advanced malignancies. But um, I think that that is, I think first we needed the ability to measure these things. And once we can measure them, I think now we need to understand the biologic limits. And I, I don't think, I think we have some ideas, but I think in, in many cases, they're overly conservative. Thank you. I don't see any questions in, in, in chat or the questions and answer panel. So I think- um, We, we uh, are ahead of time, Yasek. Maybe I can uh, uh, get a, a, a quick question in. Uh, this is- Oh, sure. Uh, from my understanding, uh, a better understanding the actual uh, uh, therapy uh, of uh, iodine-131. One, one uh, Dr. Prima, you, you mentioned that um, it's helpful to get the late image uh, of the iodine to understand uh, differences between patients uh, and, and uh, their, uh, their uptakes. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I understand uh, how do you fr fractionate uh, the iodines or is it given um, just once uh, for the therapy? And um, if it is given once, does it make any sense to consider um, fractionating where the uh, first dose would give you an idea of the particular patient uh, and um, how it progresses over, uh, over days so that the second fractionation can account for um, any special conditions in the patient? Um, is, is that a reasonable question to ask? Yeah. So, so right now with the, the FDA approved label is two treatments at that eight millicaries per kilo. Um, clinical use has been very frequently people have done lower administered activities with more cycles. Um, but generally each cycle has been given about three or more months apart. And so they really are individual fractions from uh, a radiobiologic perspective. I think fractionation with um, these low dose rate systemic radiopharmaceuticals is a really interesting topic. Um, and especially interesting now that the external beam community keeps going to less and less fractionation. And um, I do think there is probably a sweet spot where you do get some differential effect in tumor versus normal tissue. And so I think that um, we're really very much still, I think in the infancy, even though this field has been around for a long time, um, most of the treatments we give have been single fraction, single um, agent treatments. Now we have multiple cycles of therapy, but generally not fractionated in the radiobiologic sense um, and still generally single agent. I think there's a huge amount of room for us to grow with combined therapies as well as consideration of fractionation. Um, and the other piece of the fractionation piece for things that do have a lot of external dosimetry like I-131, a fractionated dose may make some of the radiation safety issues a little bit more tolerable. Um, where Thank you, you. May Thank you. That's a very, very informative. I appreciate that. And uh, we are so now uh, back on time. So uh, let us go on to the, uh, to the next speaker, um, Mike King from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, will speak to us on quantitative SPECT imaging, a mainstay diagnosis for cardiac interventions. Mike, we look forward to your talk. My name is Mike King. 
and I am from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. I would like to thank Dr. Zubal for inviting me to give this talk on quantitative spect cardiac imaging. Here is my disclaimer and disclosures. And um, nuclear imaging has been a mainstay of cardiology for more than 40 years. For the last 30 years, uh, mitochondrial perfusion imaging, or MPI, has dominated nuclear cardiac imaging. In MPI, we employ an imaging agent that clears rapidly from the bloodstream, as shown in this figure, which shows the uh, clearance into the uh, cardiac uh, versus blood flow for different uh, imaging agents, including uh, SPECT agents and PET agents. MPI has been called one-stop shopping due to its ability to uh, assess both perfusion of arteries and microvasculature at both rest and stress, in addition to quantifying left ventricular wall motion and function. A significant amount of work has gone into the display and analysis of MPI studies. When, a, when attenuation correction is included, since CT data is acquired sequentially with the emission data, one usually starts by checking the alignment of the emission data with uh, the attenuation maps from the CT to make sure that none of the wall from the uh, LV falls into the left ventricular volume. If so, then it could potentially be undercorrected for attenuation. Then for viewing the myocardium, one typically starts by reordering the transverse slice data uh, for the heart relative to the long axis of the heart. The long axis of the heart is uh, defined as the center point of the apex and then the line coming out from that, which is in the center of the blood volume. One then goes out and creates slices perpendicular to that line that go the short distance across the heart, hence they're called the short axis slices. They start at the apex and move along that uh, long axis of the heart. And then you can form other slices from that in other directions perpendicular to those. For example, you can have the vertical long axis that are gonna show you the anterior and inferior wall and not shown here would be the uh, horizontal long axis that would show the septal and lateral walls of the heart. One also shows both the stress study and the rest study. And the idea would be that in looking at these, if there was a defect in the stress study, but not the rest, then one would think of this as being a uh, ischemic situation where there was uh, a decrease in blood flow at stress, but the wall was well, adequately perfused at rest. And if the defect was present at both stress and rest, it'd be a fixed defect, which uh, would involve uh, significant blockage of the arteries. Um, the information from these slices can also be condensed into a single planar image by the process of forming polar maps. In a polar map, one starts by taking the counts at the center of the apex and puts them in the center of the polar map and then moves out along the long axis a little bit and uh, sends out rays from that long axis determines the maximum counts along those rays, uh, gets a uh, count profile. That count profile is then wrapped around that center point. We go out to the next location, it's wrapped around again, and we keep repeating the process until we get all the way out to the base. Uh, the net result is then we have a portrayal of the perfusion uh, for the entire uh, myocardium shown in this one planar image. We then normalize the counts in this by finding the maximum dividing by that and then multiplying by 100% so that the counts in this map are relative to the maximum uh, within the map. We can then compare that to a database of such maps formed from normals. Um, and typically these normals would be gender matched um, if we don't have attenuation correction involved. But if we've done attenuation correction, then one no longer needs to have gender matched attenuation maps. Uh, from these maps, we can divide the polar map into segments that are typically 17, as shown here. And these can be uh, kind of like um, correlated with different territories or perfusions of the wall for the three different cardiac territories. Uh, one can then uh, read these in terms of providing a score in terms of the level of significance of any perfusion defect that's seen, 
from zero for normal up to four for absence of uptake, or you can go in and have this quantified by computer where the computer takes that database of normals, uh, finds out the average value at, at each location, um, subtracts two times the standard deviation of those values in the polar map from that and gets a lower limit of normal. And any point that deviates down below that would be a potential defect and we get our total perfusion deficit would then be the combination of all those values. And that would be a numerical score that could be used to give you an idea of the potential for uh, cardiac issues. We can add a quantification of function to this by adding in the AKG. And by acquiring AKG, we can associate the R wave with the beginning of diastole or contraction. We can go from one R wave to another and divide that up into eight different bins by combining those bins for multiple cardiac cycles, we can get the data to then go out to reconstruct uh, different slices for different times points during the cardiac cycle. We can then take those and segment them to find out the LV wall. Um, you know, once we have the estimate of the LV wall, we can estimate the LV volumes, the ejection from that, we can also get the ejection fraction, measures of wall thickening and, and wall motion and even systolic synchrony or disorder in terms of contraction. These can be then rendered into images where we might have like the epicardial boundary shown as a wire uh, frame, and then the inner volume shown as a shaded surface. And uh, with these, we can set that into motion and have a visualization of the control. Because of the importance of cardiac imaging, manufacturers have developed dedicated cardiac spec systems. Uh, these systems have smaller heads than your standard system, cardiac systems, uh, and um, are oriented at 90 degrees to each other. The reason being that we typically use 180 degrees for reconstruction of cardiac imaging because of the asymmetric location of the heart, so that we would go from, for example, the right anterior oblique to the left posterior oblique in rotation every 180 degrees. With two heads at 90 degrees, we could cover that span by only rotating the unit over 90 degrees. Lately, there are now new dedicated uh, multi-element uh, cameras uh, that have been developed. Uh, for example, these can consist of a scintillator, such as cesium iodide with photodiodes behind it, or with a semiconductor, such as pixelated zinc cadmium telluride. And in this unit, we have uh, such detectors uh, put on to nine different vertical columns within this container. Uh, those columns, columns then wobble in the medial lateral direction during acquisition to acquire the cardiac study. And also we can have a CZT detectors. Uh, in this case, we'll have 19 focus spindle collimators uh, in three rows looking at these pixelated CD to CZT detectors. So this uh, system can acquire an image without any rotation at all, making it really good for doing dynamic imaging. A lot of work has gone into improving the reconstruction used in cardiac imaging over that of the standard filtered back projection used originally. Uh, as an example of that, this is one study that we uh, reported in 2003. And in it, we did an ROC study for 100 patients with cardiac catheterization or low likelihood to determine the truth. We had seven uh, physicians read the study uh, giving um, levels of confidence as to the presence of coronary artery disease. We uh, calculated ROC curves from that data uh, for filtered back projection, then iterative reconstruction with attenuation correction, iterative with attenuation correction and scatter, and then attenuation scatter and including correction for the distance dependent resolution. And as you can see, as the level of correction for the degradation screen during, during imaging uh, increased, the area under the ROC curve and some diagnostic performance of the study also increased. Um, these uh, studies were uh, filtered by a 3D post Gaussian filtering to have been optimized beforehand for each different uh, technique. Um, and that was then to control the noise in the studies. Talking about controlling noise in the studies, uh, we've also taken a look at um, doing deep learning to control noise. And this was done uh, taking a look at both uh, iterative reconstruction with all corrections and filtered back projection. Uh, 
and looking at it as we decrease the level counts so we could decrease the activity injected or the time of imaging by a factor of two, four, eight, 16, so on and so forth for again, both uh, iterative with corrections or filled with back projection. And uh, these values were the values we got with 3D post Gaussian filtering that had been optimized. And then we trained uh, a network to try and bring back these studies to the same quality as we had for the full count studies. And you can see that in terms of the ROC uh, curves that we got here, the areas under the ROC curves, uh, now we used a TPD or the total perfusion deficit um, as the numerical observer instead of human observers take these values. But we definitely had an improvement with deep learning filtering of these studies, uh, such that, for example, we could decrease the counts down to a factor of 16 and still have the same area under the curve as we had with filter back projection with all the counts present. Uh, the use of, of DL and reconstruction can go beyond that of uh, just denoising. Uh, for example, this group uh, at Yale uh, has done some great work on using DL uh, processing of reconstructed scatter window and photo peak window data to predict attenuation maps. They trained it with studies where they had the attenuation uh, map uh, available and then tested it on studies uh, to see if the predicted map matched the attenuation map and they got excellent results. So there's a lot of promise that at least for attenuation correction, uh, CT systems may not be needed on uh, spec systems. Quantitative database uh, or database relative quantification of perfusion is very good at finding alteration of perfusion between different cardiac territories, but is challenged by decreases in perfusion uh, from, from the left main artery that supplies the entire heart. So with global decreases, it's hard to, to tell those with relative quantification. Thus, measurement of absolute blood flow is a great interest. This has been done for years by PEP, but now is being done by the new generation of cardiac spec systems. And this is a comparison uh, that was uh, recently came out from the University of, Iowa, University of Ottawa Heart Institute, um, which used tetrafosmin as a perfusion agent and a multi-panel dedicated spec system. Um, they did a one day stress rest protocol, an eliminate list mode acquisition, did some modeling, calculated the myocardial blood flow, compared it to a state of art PET system where they had um, either 25 for morbidity 82 or six patients for ammonia. Um, and uh, the patients were uh, compared after uh, being no more than, well, on average, 19 days apart. Um, if we take a look at the calculated myocardial blood flow uh, without and with attenuation correction, we can see that the attenuation correction actually was a little bit not quite as good in terms of the R squared values as with, but both were very good, uh, showing a remarkable agreement between spec and PET. Over in this one, we have uh, with motion correction and with correction for a uh, binding of the materials to the blood cells, red blood cells. Um, and the black squares are at rest, the red squares are at stress. Notice how well they agree between PET and SPECT. And then we went over adding an attenuation correction. Again, as we said, it wasn't quite as good. It decreased a little bit in terms of our squared value. Uh, but again, uh, uh, what appears to be a very good agreement between rest and stress between the two modalities. Uh, they reported that their study showed in terms of global myocardial blood flow that there was a good correlation between SPECT and PET. They also reported that the uh, global measurements were not significantly improved by attenuation correction as shown here, but that when they went to regional measurements, uh, attenuation correction actually did improve things. And that makes sense because regionally attenuation might have some impact upon the values that are being reported. Okay, so in conclusion, quantitative SPECT is a mainstay of cardiac imaging. SPECT provides quantification of database of relative perfusion and absolute quantification of myocardial blood flow. SPECT also provides quantification of parameters of LV wall function. Radio pharmaceutical developments, imaging system design optimization, software advances, and guidelines standards promulgated by medical societies have all played a role in establishing and advancing the clinical utility of cardiac SPECT. With similar developments for unsealed source radionuclide therapy agents, SPECT 
undoubtedly would, would play a role there also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for that very interesting presentation. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the, these two presentations uh, uh, are meant to demonstrate um, that given an important application, there are SPECT imaging techniques that can deliver for the uh, clinical needs of these uh, special applications. Uh, and yeah, cardiac certainly is a, a very good example. And we'll hear from uh, uh, Dr. Mack uh, next uh, on, on brain imaging. So Mike, just a quick question as we're accumulating some others in the, uh, in the QA box. Uh, thanks for showing some of the uh, other geometries, uh, other cameras that were developed for cardiac. Um, would you agree uh, and uh, further comment on um, the different uh, the, the different camera geometries? Um, uh, everything from uh, 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 chairs that were used for imaging, uh, you know, versus uh, special detectors and L-shaped. Um, how important is it uh, for good cardiac imaging uh, to respond to the particular application at hand? And this would hopefully lead into our discussions of uh, therapy cameras later. Thank you very much, George, for the question. Um, well, I'd say that it makes a great deal of difference um, in terms of your ability to match the imaging task with the equipment that you're going to use to perform it. Uh, for example, uh, with the two heads at 90 degrees, if you're only acquiring 180 degrees worth of data, uh, you get twice the sensitivity of having those two heads at, at 180 degrees, where one head has spent all of its time really not acquiring any, any data that's useful whatsoever. Uh, that's a very simple one. Uh, going to some kind of a dynamic task, we have a multi pinhole configuration where you no longer have to rotate around the patient. That uh, would give you the advantage of being able to uh, do a list mode study and then bin the data up and reconstruct for very short intervals. And as the activity accumulates and is no longer rapidly changing, then you can bin the activity for longer time intervals, generate uh, curves, uh, kinetic curves, um, and this would give you an idea perhaps into symmetry in terms of being able to get your early changes, but I know the things we're looking at now probably are dominated by the later time course in terms of the kinetics. Uh, so but I think I'll stop there. Uh, then, right. of course, you have different detectors. Uh, going to CCT is going to give you better energy resolution, reduce the scatter. Uh, you know, there's many things that one can do in terms of the geometry and the detectors themselves. Yeah, so uh, just changing the geometry uh, and detectors, it can vastly improve uh, the task at hand. Uh, and that's, that's been done to a, a fairly um, extensive, um, ec uh, that was done extensively for cardiac imaging. Um, we, we've seen many uh, dedicated cardiac cameras and um, uh, maybe we can discuss how dedicated cameras could be developed for, uh, for therapy purposes. So that, that leads to our panel discussions later. Uh, and we are uh, back on time. So uh, let's go to our, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's go to our uh, last presentation in this session uh, by uh, Dr. Robert Mack, uh, University of Pennsylvania. He will uh, speak to us on PET and SPECT, complementary benefits, synergies, and challenges. Dr. Mack. Right, thank you. I, I've been asked to give a brief talk today on the role of PET and SPECT in brain imaging, in particular on their, their complementary benefits, the synergies, and the challenges that the, the field faces with respect to uh, the, the future and the future of brain imaging studies. Um, this may seem like an odd topic uh, because PET has really been a, such a, a, a powerful tool used in, in, in brain imaging studies. And one asks the question is really what role could SPEC have? And I think SPEC could actually have a, a very prominent role going forward. Um, it doesn't today, but I think there are reasons for that. And I think 
in order to understand the reasons for that, one needs to, to step back in time and look at how these two modalities have evolved over the past 30 years. Now, when I got in the field in the 1980s, PET was largely a research tool. The reason being that the isotope availability was a problem. You needed a, an on-site cyclotron to, to produce the radionuclides for uh, used in PET imaging studies. And it wasn't reimbursed either that uh, uh, the studies that we're doing on a PET scanner, uh, there were no reimbursable procedures. So it was a very powerful research tool, but it was a research only tool. SPECT on the other hand, had very widespread availability, largely because of the Technetium 99M generator. It was the workhorse of nuclear medicine. And SPECT had a very large presence in the field of nuclear medicine. Let's look at today. It's a very different world today. PET is widely available. There are many procedures are reimbursable. Um, uh, SPECT, on the other hand, although it is widely available and reimbursable, it hasn't grown and hasn't enjoyed the growth that PET has had over the past a few years. And it's really limited to the studies such as, uh, simple studies such as uh, perfusion studies in cardiology, bone scans and, 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 and uh, uh, liver scans and things of that nature. It's the level of sophistication of, of SPEC clearly isn't what PET is today. The reason for that is, but is because there's been a very active R&D pipeline in developing pet tracers for doing very sophisticated studies. However, SPECT really has had no advancement or very little advancement of, of radio tracer development uh, over the past 10 to 15 years. So, so how did this happen? Well, there have been a number of breakthroughs, particularly on the side of PET, that really has uh, made it the, the, the imaging technique that it is today. The first thing is that FDG, the analog of glucose that measures tumor glu uh, util glucose utilization, uh, proved to be a superior uh, tumor imaging agent. It became clinically reimbursable and there's no SPECT equivalent. So, so SPECT is a procedure that PET can do, but there's no way of doing this with SPECT. That in combination with the availability of, of medical cyclotrons that reduce the cost of cyclotrons, uh, the availability of automated chemistry systems for doing PET radiosynthesis, made PET a, a somewhat affordable technique that now a lot of medical centers could afford to do. So the reimbursement of FDG and the availability of, of, of uh, the technology for producing the isotopes and doing radiochemistry improved dramatically. And that was the first breakthrough. The second breakthrough is the availability of the whole body PET CT, which made it very easy to interpret PET scans. And it led to the simplification of scan imaging protocols where you had a very short uptake phase a very short static acquisition, and you did a very simple form of data analysis called SUV analysis that enabled you to, to identify tumors, their location, and it's used in the, in the diagnosis and staging of cancer. A more recent breakthrough is the availability of these amyloid imaging agents that uh, enable PET to move beyond tumor imaging studies with FDG, and, and, and this is a, another reimbursable procedure, and it has really promoted the, the, the uh, NeuroPET uh, in the US. But the question I ask is, for these studies, is, is PET really necessary? And is PET really the only tool that can be used for, for, for brain imaging studies? And to answer that question, I'd like to take a closer look at the uh, beta amyloid imaging studies. Now, this is a study using Florbeta pair. It is looking at uh, the uptake of this tracer, which binds the A beta plaques in Alzheimer's patients versus an age mass control. And you can see visually, you have a high uptake of the radio tracer in the Alzheimer's patient, much more so than the control patient. How we do these studies is we inject the tracer, uh, we let it accumulate over a, a, a 40 minute period or so. And then we have a static acquisition period of around 20 minutes. And we compare the uptake of the tracer in a region of interest and divide it by a reference region, in this case, the cerebellum. And what you get is a measure called the SUVR, which is the ratio of the SUV values in these two regions of interest, okay? Very simple way of analyzing the data, a very straightforward way of acquiring the data, and it has really simplified the PET procedures. The question I ask is, do you need PET? Can SPECT work here? Well, here's an example of a, an iodine-123 amyloid imaging agent and a SPECT study in an Alzheimer's patient. And you can see you get very good images uh, 
uh, of these uh, uptake of the radio tracer in the Alzheimer's patients and no uptake in the control patients. So visually, you have good signal to noise ratio and you can quantify the uptake of the SPEC probe in exactly the same way we did in the, with the PET probe in a prior slide, and that's the SUVR analysis. And you can see in the graphs on the right that you can really tell, see the difference in the uptake of the probe and the Alzheimer's patients relative to the age match controls. In this study, they also compared the SPEC tracer head to head with floor beta pair. And you can see visually the images are very similar. You have high uptake in the Alzheimer's patients with both the SPEC probe and the PET probe. But when you look at the, the quantitative data, in this case, the SUVR values, the data is very, very similar, very equivalent. The SPEC probe actually is quite comparable to the data that one obtains using PET. So in this first case, we show that PET actually is equivalent. So for some brain imaging studies, I think SPEC actually can work as well as PET. If you have a case where there's a high target density and a large dynamic range, uh, that will spec will work well. It'll work equivalent to PET. And in the case we just saw in the, in the prior slide, if you have a, a low target density in a control group like in A-beta and a reasonable to high target density in the patient group, in the Alzheimer's patient, and your spec probe is good enough, meaning good enough meaning having high affinity and low non-specific binding, then you can get good data. And in this case, SPECT is equivalent to PET. Are there cases where there are advantages of PET, uh, sorry, advantages of SPECT over PET? And I think there are. And a perfect example of that is shown on this slide. This is a study out of Mass General where it's using simultaneous injection with two different SPEC probes, an iodine-123 tracer measuring dopamine terminal density, and a technetium agent that measures cerebral blood flow. And if you know, doing the, the study where you have the appropriate algorithms and you can separate the photo peaks between iodine and technetium 99M, you can actually quantify the uptake of these two isotopes and you can measure two different things in the brain, terminal density versus cerebral blood flow. This, is, this type of study is called a dual isotope study. You can do this with SPECT, but these types of studies simply are not possible with PET because as you know, all PET isotopes have the 511 KEV. So it's impossible to do dual isotope studies with PET. You would have to do those studies on two separate imaging days or sessions, and which are often done on two separate days. So another advantage of SPECT, and in this case where SPECT I think has advantages over PET, is that you have the, the opportunity to do these dual isotope imaging studies. Are there other advances in PET that are worth noting? I think there are, in particular the development of the CZT detector system, which is cadmium zinc telluride. Uh, this is a very compact uh, detector system. It enables you to, to make uh, uh, improved detector design where you can achieve very high spatial resolution for SPECT imaging studies. And an example of that is shown on this slide. This is a study out of the group at the University of Illinois. And it um, is, is uh, looking at a very high resolution SPECT scanner that they've developed that has sub-millimeter resolution. And uh, the data I'd like to point, your, uh, point out and draw your attention to are the images shown on the right. These are a series of lymphoma cells that have been labeled with iodine-125 and injected into the brain of a mouse. And they've looked at uh, the cell density ranging from 50,000 cells down to 750 cells. And you can see even in the, the, the images with 750 cells, you get very good contrast, very good resolution. And the concentration of radioactivity in this slice is 2.5 nanocuries uh, per slice. So this shows you that because of this improvement in detector design, uh, you can get very high resolution, very high sensitivity, and sub-millimeter resolution. This is a, another breakthrough that has occurred in SPECT over the past few years. So because of this improvement in resolution and, and, and improved detector design, it is theoretically possible to image very small brain structures um, such as the substantia nigra, the local ceruleus, or the dentate gyrus, structures that are virtually impossible, let's say difficult, if not impossible to image with your standard PET CT scanner. So in this case, PET um, uh, really uh, is, is not as, does not have this type of spatial resolution that, that SPEC potentially has, and SPEC has advantages over PET in this regard.
The next question I ask is, is it possible to have the best of both worlds? Can we actually take advantages of having a scanner that can use both PET and SPECT isotopes? We now know we can. There are scanners that can do this. This is the vector scanner that was developed by MI Labs. And it's a, a scanner that enables you to do simultaneous measurements of a PET radio tracer and a SPECT radio tracer. It's limited to small animal imaging studies. But as you can see in this study, they looked at glucose utilization in the brain using F18 and FDG and dopamine transporter uh, density using iodine-123 DAT scan. And it, you can see with this scanner, you are able to do, get PET measurements of glucose utilization as well as dopamine terminal density. This is a very powerful imaging technique, unfortunately limited only to small animal imaging studies, but one can imagine the power that, uh, of this imaging technique if it can be expanded and increased to do human brain imaging studies. Um, why is this important? And why, why would a, a, a scanner capable of imaging PET and SPECT simultaneously be useful in brain imaging studies? Well, here's a, a study on the right that is used in Alzheimer's, a typical study in Alzheimer's disease today, where it uses two radio tracers, an A-beta uh, radio tracer, Florbeta pair, and a tau imaging agent called Flortalsapir. And you can see in Alzheimer's disease in, uh, with A-beta, you get a high uptake uh, of, of the probe, the A-beta plaques, which occurs very early in a disease process. And this is a person with advanced disease because you can see there's high uptake of the tau tracer. And tau is typically used to study advanced, uh, the, the progression of Alzheimer's disease to advanced stages. So in this study, two different PET imaging agents are used, both labeled with F18, two separate sessions, often done on two separate days, and we know in this patient population, it's, it's, it can be somewhat difficult to get them to come back for two imaging sessions to do both the A-beta scan and the tau scan. However, if you have a SPECT probe that can take the place of one of these, and one of these I think would be the amyloid imaging agent, you can do this study with a dual isotope study where the SPECT probe and the uh, F18 tau agent can be administered simultaneously, the data acquired in one imaging session, and you can measure a, beta, and tau in the same patient on the same day in the same imaging session. That is a very powerful technique. And this is only one example of how this dual isotope study using a PET and a SPECT tracer uh, can be used to provide some, some very, do some, some very sophisticated studies and, and do some very elaborate uh, imaging studies. So we think the potential for having PET, SPECT, CT scanners for brain imaging studies certainly increases the level of sophistication of the types of studies and the types of brain imaging studies one can do if these scanners were available. But what are the limitations? Well, on the SPECT side of things, we see we've had great advances in detective design and improvements that led to great small animal imaging systems but they're not available yet for human imaging studies. So what needs to be done is we need to translate um, that technology into having head-only scanners, which can be used for, for, for brain uh, imaging studies in, in human subjects. Um, isotope availability is, is also an issue, particularly with iodine-123. I think iodine-123 is probably the best radionuclide for developing uh, spec-based brain imaging agents. The availability of that is very limited. I think steps need to be taken to try to increase the availability of iodide-123 in order to grow the field. But the field really isn't gonna grow, particularly for in the spec side of things, unless there's effort made in improving and advancing spec radio tracer development. This is something that has not occurred over the past 15 years. Many of the studies that you're seeing being used in spec studies today were developed uh, 15 to 20 years ago, and this needs to be made a priority. So if we are really going to advance the field of, of brain imaging, particularly with respect to the, the ability to use uh, spec imaging studies for brain imaging studies, we have to really have better radio tracers uh, than, than what is available today. So, with that, um, I will end my talk, and I, be, but before doing so, I'd like to thank a couple of people, uh, uh, George Zubal and Xuming Wong, and uh, Dave Mankoff, Dan Prima, and Scott Metzler at the University of Pennsylvania, who helped me uh, uh, prepare this and gave me uh, uh, ideas as to how to, to present this talk uh, on this topic, all right? So with that, thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Bob, very much uh, for a very, 
insightful look at uh, nuclear medicine imaging, the uh, two modalities that we have that sometimes compete, sometimes complement each other of uh, SPECT and PET. Um, since you are the last speaker and the next is a panel discussion, uh, I'd like to set up for the panel discussion and then get to any specific questions uh, to you uh, or, uh, or the other speakers. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, all of the speakers are panel discussants. So uh, if you are a speaker, feel free to uh, ask um, a question at this or uh, other panel discussions. Uh, the reason is to, uh, the reason for the workshop is to kind of get as many voices uh, and viewpoints uh, mixed together as possible. Uh, there are four people that are not speakers that we invited uh, to be panel discussants. If you can turn your videos on, Sarah Cheel, Robert Mioka, Emily Roncalli, Vic Vikram. Um, due to the limited uh, time uh, and format of this workshop, we were sorry we couldn't have you as speakers, uh, but your input as panelists would be very, uh, uh, very appreciated. So if you could just introduce yourself and your affiliation, um, once you're introduced, uh, we will go on to the uh, panel discussion for, um, uh, for this session one. Uh, I'm, on my screen, I see Emily as the uh, first person up in the box. If you could please introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Ronkavi. I'm an assistant professor in biomedical engineering and uh, radiology at the University of California, Davis. Uh, my research spans two areas. One is more on the radiation detector development side with a lot of computational tools. And the other one is um, looking at dosimetry for radio pharmaceutical therapy. Thank you. Um, next is Sarah on my screen. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Cheel, and I'm a senior research scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I'm a radiochemist in the lab of Steve Larson, and my um, the focus of my work is really um, everything pre-targeting. So I've been working with uh, Dr. Larson and our collaborators for the past decade to advance these concepts and and uh, direct those projects. Thank you, Robert. Uh... Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Robert Mioka. I'm a research professor of radiology at the University of Washington. And while well, a lot of my career, I've done a lot of work with uh, PET instrumentation. I've more recently been doing some work to try to develop technology that will enable kind of um, more convenient uh, personalization for um, some lutetium theranostics. And, and I'm also looking, interested in some new geometries for um, single photon imaging applications. Thank you. And Vic Vikram, thank you for joining us. Please introduce sure. yourself. Yeah, I'm a radiation oncologist and I serve as chief of the clinical radiation oncology branch in the division of cancer treatment and diagnosis at the NCI. Uh, and I oversee a portfolio of clinical trials uh, involving radiation, including radio pharmaceuticals recently. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's figure out the best way to do this. Yasik, do you, do you have a list of questions I, back yes. to the uh, particular yes. speakers? Let's go through yes, those I have, first. I have a question. And this is a question for a speaker that you know, perhaps went for a vacation to avoid this question, but I hope that everyone can help Sarah to answer that. That was to Dr. Larson was that uh, I believe it was by Martin Tornal on Duke. I believe that limits stated by Dr. Larson were de derived from the 50s. How and when will those values be revised? This is about the limitation to the normal tissues. Sarah, yeah, I, you give a shot. Sure, of course. Um, so I, I really appreciate Dr. Zaval and Dr. Prima's um, discussion earlier on how conservative those values are. You know, I think the intention, Dr. Larson's intention 
um, was really to just highlight that we have to be aware of them and that these are some potential dose limits, but that certainly um, they're constantly undergoing refinement. So um, I absolutely, if anyone has any suggestions, what I was thinking of doing was putting those dose tolerances into the chat box um, just to remind everyone of what they were. And, you know, uh, if, if anyone has any suggestions on how we could potentially refine them, I, I would really appreciate that. So there is a follow-up question for one of the panelists. I don't know, Vic, do you want to ask when, ask it or? No, I think Vic is busy, so ask me to. So the question is follow-up question on this actually. So for this is for Dr. Larson and Prima. Uh, in your opinion, when it is better to perform analysis or absorb dose vis-a-vis -vis toxicity? during early phase small trials before FDA approval or with larger number of patients after FDA approval? It's a great question. So, I mean, I think really there's always the balance between complexity and simplicity, between having something available that helps versus having something that's really optimized but might not become available, which doesn't help anyone. Um, and so I do think that really the right place for a lot of this understanding is in basic research, small groups, um, early phase trials, and then hopefully being able to distill it down the way that um, the Memorial Sloan Kettering group has done with I-124 dosimetry, where they found a time point where you can apply population levels and get one imaging time point and really learn a huge amount from it. Because I don't think it's likely that we're going to be doing super intricate dosimetry in every single patient treated. Um, I think what we need to do is do that super intricate dosimetry, figure out what, how much data we really need, um, but not compromise on that. And whatever we figure out that we need, it's um, from external beam, you're not going to not do a simulation in some patients because it's too complicated, but we've made what are incredibly complicated simulations be things that can be done relatively quickly without too much burden on the patient. And I think that's what we really need to achieve with radio pharmaceuticals. So there is another question for, for Dan, for you. Uh, this is from William Warstow. He asks, very nice talk, thank you. Are there, are there other non-radiological signals that might be used in conjunction with dosimetry that might correlate with dosimetry reliably and hence improve signal to noise on the dosimetry measurement? Yeah, and I think, um... A lot of this goes along with the, the pharmacokinetics of a lot of these drugs. Um, they are systemically delivered agents and a lot of pharmacology work can be done. Unlike regular um, you know, chemotherapy, yeah. unlabeled things, we can't really track them in the organs, but we can do blood PK data. Um, and we can do that with pharmaceuticals, radio pharmaceuticals, but also have some imaging data. And I think you could really use that to hone in on something. So if you know population norms and you can get some data points on kinetics in a patient that you could get with just a simple blood test on day one and day seven, say of the first treatment cycle and really learn a lot about the terminal kinetics in that patient and use that to, to fit the curve. Uh, I think that some of those things can be really powerful. So I think having um, some, some expertise from the pharmaceutical world helping to weigh in um, can, because I think we have a physics problem and a biology problem. And I think there's not any one single person that has the expertise to really optimize it. So the, another question back to Dr. Larson's presentation is by uh, Tai Ikotun. The question is that the pre-targeting works very well in settings where the target is human in mouse. How well do you anticipate this PRIT approach would work when there are expression in non-target tissues, particularly highly vascularized tumors and its impact on host immunity, Sarah. Sure, thank you so much um, for answer, you know, asking this question, uh, especially with the GPA33 target and the, um, the gut uh, expression in humans that we can't, um, recapitulate in the mice. I, I think it's an excellent, excellent question. And what we're doing is um, really two things. You know, first off, we're doing extensive studies in non-human primates to that 
do have gut expression to understand the kinetics of turnover because um, when you're exploring therapy of that target, you're relying on differential turnover between the tumor and the gut. And so that's one thing we're doing. And then second, you know, we're developing these antibody forms that Dr. Larson touched on, the SADA forms that have um, that are humanized and also have reduced immunogenicity profiles so that we can facilitate uh, theranostics as well as um, repeat cycle treatments. So next we have two questions for, uh, for Dr. King. One is from uh, Masa Torkman. And the question is, some recent research shows that attenuation correction can be done in an end-to-end -end manner without requiring generating attenuation map as an intermediate step. Can you, in your opinion regarding the import, can, can you give your opinion regarding the importance of attenuation map? Can this step be skipped or do you think physicians still prefer to look, look at the attenuation map and correct the image both? Thanks. Well, yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, certainly with deep learning, one could go about uh, generating an attenuation map of sorts, but never really forming it and, and effectively doing the corrections uh, without uh, separating out the attenuation map and displaying it uh, to the physicians. But I think the physicians would like to see the attenuation map just to have some confidence, that, at least at this point, that their, uh, what was being used to do the attenuation correction made some sense to them uh, compared to uh, what they have been used to seeing from CTs or other sources at this point. Um, so clinically, it's always nice to have a, you know, a check on what's going on so that you don't have too much uh, being invisible to the physicians. So the next question was again from William Worstel and he asked, he you know, compliments you about this as usual as everyone, but then the question is, given the narrow therapeutic window for some of the teranostics we've heard about earlier, would you predict dedicated SPECT only instrumented, perhaps augmented with co-registered either patient specific or synthesized CT from the emission information plus whatever fiducious versus SPECT CT? How important do you see the price point being or for perhaps dedicated geometry SPECT versus SPECT CT? particularly of more expensive technologies like CT, CZT show promises for this application. It's complicated. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that, that's a long question. I'll try not to make my answer as long as the question, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so uh, one, um, there's been a lot of work that shows that you can generate the attenuation maps like from deep learning or we did some work years ago of uh, trying to generate them straight from uh, scatter window and uh, generating the attenuation map from the, from the uh, scatter window acquisition data. Uh, uh, so uh, I think there is some promise for that uh, with the low counts though, not getting into the uh, applications for this meeting. Link with the low counts you get from some of the alpha emitters um, you know, maybe there's going to be some issues there on not having enough statistics to do a good generation of attenuation maps. My own belief is that what I'd like to do is use something that we've been working on, and that is to have um, uh, depth sensing cameras. These are near infrared cameras that uh, image uh, the distance to the surface of an object. Uh, with that, you can um, for example, for brain imaging, you can map out the face of a patient. You could use that to then register a CT or an MRI acquired of that patient, you know, one that's already existing, and generate your attenuation maps that way. And you can also then use those to do corrections for motion. So I would think that maybe adding in some near infrared or other type cameras, uh, which are $100 or $200 a piece, uh, a couple of those, would give you a nice price point compared to adding a CT. Uh, but if you're really going to try and get in and have some um, subtle look at the, the anatomy, having a CT would be good, whether it's done by registering or, uh, or not, uh, or on the system itself, that would be a price issue. Okay, thank you. 
So now I think we're moving to, um, oh no, there's another question I believe from this, on this, uh, this uh, thread of questions. Will the sensitivity, which is always lower than PET, be a limitation for using SPECT for brain studies? Yeah, I think that that question was directed to me. Actually, I think there, there are three sure. questions in a row that have been directed to me that um, really have to do with the uh, physics side of these scanners. So I will give a, a radiochemist uh, answer to these questions, and then I will pass the ball over to the real experts to, to fill in the gap. So um, the first question has to do with sensitivity of spec versus PET. You know, I, I thought that as well, you know, I'm, I'm again a pet person and I've always was under the impression that the sensitivity of spec was, was, was much lower than pet. But I think with the improved detective designs, the sensitivity has dramatically improved over the past few years. Uh, does it approach pet? I'm not sure if it doesn't. I think it, it's pretty close. But again, the experts can, can, can answer that question. Um, with respect to the example I showed for A, beta, and tau imaging, could one use two uh, SPECT radio tracers? And I think yeah, that certainly is possible. The, the other example I showed, looking at cerebral perfusion with a, a technetium 99M uh, 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 perfusion tracer with the DAT scan, which is iodine-123, clearly shows that you can image perfusion and dopamine uh, terminal density uh, provided you were able to uh, resolve the photo peaks. I think when that study was done, it was done on a triple headed spec scanner. It was quite difficult to resolve those photo peaks and it took a, it was pretty intensive to be able to do that. I, I don't think that uh, is the case today. And again, I think the, the experts can fill in the gaps, but um, having an iodine-123 and technetium 99 m labeled pair certainly opens the door for doing uh, dual isotope studies with a, a SPECT only scanner. And as for the scatter, I think the, the, the same issue may uh, apply here. It's how well you can resolve the photo peaks between the, uh, the, the PET isotope and the SPECT isotope with respect to how much scatter will uh, influence the images. And I think that you know if you're able to separate those photo peaks uh, very well, then it should diminish the amount of scatter. It probably won't get rid of it, but it should reduce it. So. So that is a radiochemist answer to these uh, physics questions. So I, I will let the, the real experts uh, fill in the gaps. Any comments of that from the panelists? Well, I could take a stab at it. I won't say I'm the real expert, but uh, uh, we are working on a um, dedicated brain spec system. Um, and our belief is that we can get uh, significantly higher sensitivity than the current uh, spec systems. Uh, I do not believe we're going to come anywhere as near challenging the sensitivity of the Explorer PET system, though, um, when you open up your imaging uh, with that larger detectors above the patient and your sensitivities go up to, uh, the, the way their sensitivities do. Um, yeah, we're not going to be able to challenge that sensitivity and spec. Um, on the other hand, we can certainly challenge them on our price point. So uh, that would be <laughs> one way we could uh, perhaps give you images far better than what you've been seeing from SPECT uh, and yet keep the price point uh, about the same or not that much higher than what they are already uh, for the SPECT imaging, which would be you know, significantly lower than the PET scanners. Let, and let, energy but resolution, you'll have CZT. You know, our experts coming in next time, I'm looking forward to, to uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Pat Peterson's talk and to uh, Ling Meng's talk uh, coming up in the next sessions. We'll be talking about uh, CZT and um, then talking about high purity germanium, probably uh, the two of them. Let, let me throw an angle in on uh, on that uh, that that question, Mike. Um, I think one of the reasons that uh, spec sensitivity or what 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 PET sensitivity uh, takes advantage of is uh, often uh, the fact that you need to get the input function, which occurs over like sometimes 90 seconds or a minute. Uh, so you want to get a good statistics on that and you want to get the uptake into certain organs in order to calculate um, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, uh, and you know, calculate things like K1, K2, K3, K4. So you know, the first 
three to five minutes is very important and you need good quality fast images to do that. Uh, if we're talking about alpha therapy, uh, where uh, it occurs over days, uh, then uh, I think we can compare a snapshot or we can compare one frame acquired on a PET scanner uh, to one frame acquired on a spec camera where the spec camera uh, could take 10 minutes, 20 minutes uh, to, to, to get uh, one time point. So, um, you know, sensitivity on a per second or per minute basis um, uh, may not be the best way to look at it. It may be the sensitivity that you need in order to get the uptake and clearance uh, that is important. For PET, it's tens of seconds. Uh, for alpha therapy, uh, it is tens of minutes uh, uh, or sometimes days. Uh, because of the long-lived isotopes. So we should not ignore the isotopes uh, that we're imaging when we talk about sensitivity, uh, when, when we're uh, doing the modeling that's necessary, um, either for kinetics or for, or for dosimetry. So, um, uh, and, and I think the, the same uh, is true for uh, brain imaging. Um, the clinical trials that have been done with um, uh, for Alzheimer's, um, we're all snapshot images. And I think, you know, Bob Mack has referred to this previously is even though PET cameras have incredible sensitivity, you effectively for the Alzheimer's studies, you inject, you wait, and then you take a 20 minute scan. Uh, so that can also be uh, comparative. Oh um, we we, we want to keep in sight what our goal is you know, when we George? talk about sensitivity. So there is a request for Emily to comment on time of flight gain in PET. Emily, please. Right, so I'm not sure um, uh, that, you know, there are many angles on which we can comment on, on time of flight uh, gain, uh, whether it's for, uh, you know, image quality. Uh, I'm not sure if Ross is referring to uh, or in general. Um, I think, um, what is of interest in terms of radionuclear therapy dosimetry, uh, which is one of my focus, um, is combining both sensitivity but also spatial resolution. So I think this is where making new detectors uh, that can be integrated into conventional scanners or long axial field of view scanners uh, become very it, it becomes very important because this is where we can push our detector performance and eventually the, the scanner performance. So time of flight um, for anyone who works in the field of uh, PET right now is one of the major research topics uh, into improving the radiation detectors. And I think, uh, for example, for Explorer, I don't know if it's what Ross um, would like me to comment on, but the, the gain is, it depends on where you're imaging your patient. For example, I work a lot on radio embolization, which is for liver cancer. So the gain that you may have uh, is in the abdominal region and we're anticipating it's about 18 times compared to an MCT Siemens scanner, but we still are working on establishing those gains in terms of uh, sensitivity and also due to time of flight. Um, I think more generally speaking, there's a need to um, establish guidelines about what we want for our next scanners. And, and it's not a trivial question because there are many, many applications and probably each application will have a different answer to that. But I think for everyone who develops new detectors, scanners, we need to have a sense of where we need to go. Um, and this is, of course, if you're looking at combined therapies, which is something that Dan mentioned, then the criteria become different because you're looking at potentially betas, alphas, external beam therapies. So you're trying to image many different things. You're trying to calculate the dosimetry and um, combine this from many different um, uh, um, modalities as well. So I think what we need in terms of sensitivity uh, might change. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at what Ross said. Improve effective sensitivity. Oh, comparison to spec. Um, 
So you, I'm not sure if it's a uh, time of flight gain in, compared to, um, to suspect. Mm. I think, I think as uh, Mike said, uh, the uh, sensitivity of spec is always going to be, you know, uh, more of a challenge compared to bed, regardless of having a gain from the time applied or not. Um, now in the context of comparing those, uh, both modalities need to be um, improved or there's no modality that is better than the other because it just depends on what you're trying to manage. Uh, that would be, you know, um, uh, my answer to that. Okay, so now, um, now we have a couple of questions for another panelist, for Dr. <coughs> Miyoka. <coughs> and one is, do you believe that more advanced dosimetry is possible for, for PRRT? And then the other question, you mentioned new spec geometries. What is your target sensitivity improvement? Okay, so um, yeah, so I mean, I am working on some um, uh, technology to do um, kind of at home measurements for washout kinetics of uh, PRRT therapy. So I'm hoping that we can come up with some um, fairly low cost and patient friendly methods to actually do measurements rather than having to rely upon kind of uh, population based statistics. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I think that's going to be a, a definitely work in the future. Um, so I, I, I'm also looking at some geometries that for, for SPECT, where we um, basically remove the collimator. So if that happens, you know, the, the sensitivity advances could be, um, you know, a thousand times. So um, there's some different things that um, I think have potential in that area. Um, but while I, I have the floor here, I, I do have questions for two of the, the speakers and one um, for Dr. Hum. And I apologize if this was asked already. I had to take a biology break at the end of his talks. But uh, <laughs> so with the, the actinium, there's no imageable gamma, but, uh, but so you have to image the, the francium. And based upon that, what do you think is the, you know, the, the, the best kind of um, precision that we're going to be able to get in terms of the, um, the dosimetry for actinium um, or how much uncertainty is going to be thrown into that. And then for Dr. Mack, um, what kind of spatial resolution would you need in the brain imaging to really, for spec to get, to really make a big difference? I mean, we're not going to get the submillimeter potent, you know, that necessarily that you get like with the small animals, but is it one, two, three, what, how much, you know, what resolution would, would really excite you um, if we could get that inspect? Will I go first? So uh, the question is, is that you can't directly image actinium. There, there are actually photons, but they're they are very, very low. They're 14, 15 kV. So it's, 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 there is a, a signal that comes out. These are L x-rays. Uh, but uh, assuming in a patient, they would not leave the patient, you're relying on imaging the 220 kV photons from francium, which, is th which has a three minute, which is um, a three minute half-life. So when the actinium decays, the francium will detach. And I think all of us are assuming that the francium is not moving sufficiently far from where the actinium occurred. This will obviously depend on where the actinium is. If the actinium is in the bloodstream, there is a chance for the francium to, trans to move uh, further away. Uh, but in most organs, we believe that the francium will stay at the site. Th th then there is a short-lived polonium, and then there is, a, I forget, it's polonium or, or Astatine, and then it goes to bismuth, the final daughter, which has 46 yeah. minutes, that does allow us, because that has an imageable photon, that's 440 kV, we can, and, and we're looking into uh, uh, imaging the first progeny, which is the francium, and, and the bismuth. But as 
to directly answer your question, how confident are we that the francium depicts the dosimetry from the direct uh, actinium targeting agent? I think we don't know any, we don't have errors or error bars as to know how accurate that is. But of course we can see if, if the actual, since we're imaging tumor uptake based on the francium signal, uh, I guess that is the, you're getting at least that amount of dose to the tumor and you may be getting slightly more because if, if there is a detachment of the francium from the actinium, then that francium would leave that, that uh, uh, targeted tissue. So, I mean, that's the best I can answer your question, but I can't give you like, what is the percentage accuracy, which is what you, uh, what you sought, Robert. Two minute warning. Okay, I, I guess I can answer uh, Robert's question. Um, with respect to the resolution, yeah, I would be quite happy if you could get in the one to 1 1.5 millimeter range. Um, that's certainly something is a, a big challenge for a PET scanner. So if a spec scanner can, can get to around the millimeter to 1.5 millimeter range, I think that would be great. I'd be quite quite happy with that resolution. I've, I've had this discussion with uh, some of my colleagues here at Penn and, and other people in the spec field, and, and they, can, they can actually get less than one, mil, one millimeter on small animal scanners. And they believe the technology exists that you can actually build a dedicated head only unit. Again, this is a head only unit that can, can achieve some millimeter resolution. But uh, again, that's, uh, that's a, a theoretical design. I don't think a human scanner exists uh, for spec imaging that, um, that has some mil millimeter resolution, but I've been told that it certainly is possible. Uh, and one of the things, and, and, and George, one of my earlier points, you raised a, a point that I kind of skipped over in my presentation is that, you know, as you mentioned, that the big difference between SPEC and PET is the temporal resolution. PET has outstanding temporal resolution that SPEC does not, will, will never really have. Um, but when you look at some of the imaging techniques that we're using with PET today, and I showed the example of the, the amyloid imaging agents that George, you, you brought up again, and, and even FDG falls in this category. Uh, the majority of the imaging techniques that we use today really do not take advantage of that ex exquisite temporal resolution of PET. We image late, we image for about 20 minutes or longer or so. So all the, the great advantages that PET have have really not been utilized in recent years. And we really have reduced our PET imaging studies down to the level of a uh, of, of how we do spec, that is an image over a 20 minute window or so. Or so. So, so I think given the advances in spec technology and given the, the likely advances with improved uh, detector designs that can make these uh, uh, advances that occur in small animal imaging and build complementary scanners for human imaging, I, th I think there is a, a very bright future for spec um, um, going forward. So, so uh, the answer to your question, a millimeter, 1.5 millimeters would be great. And it would be nice to see human scanners that can get it for not only for brain and, and hopefully something similar to that uh, uh, for whole body imaging. I believe Dr. Mank wants to ask a question. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to make a comment on this. Uh, on the on some capability that spec may be offered, not only from research scanner, maybe from commercial scanner within the next few years coming up. And then uh, this is a one thing is uh, very much related to the, to, for example, imaging alpha therapy. And uh, I would say the newer, newer scanners might be able to have an energy resolution that you can probably see almost any line that alpha emitters is, uh, is emitting. So for example, looking at not only the actinium, but looking at uh, all the daughters, most of the daughters emitting gamma rays coming out. So I, uh, so that I think that's something coming up rel relatively quickly. And the other thing is, I believe that it is possible to achieve a spatial resolution uh, close to even below a millimeter in clinical and their practical clinical setting in the next few years. But that's, uh, that's remain to be seen as someday have to demonstrate it. But I think in principle, it will be, um, we probably will be able to do it uh, while maintaining a reasonable sensitivity. So with this, uh, with this comment, I'd like to have a question to Dr. Larson, though, uh, which is, uh, um, which is, I'm, I'm just curious if you can clearly separate actinium and all its, most of its daughters emitting gamma rays, and then being able to 
do image do images do imaging simultaneously with all those isotopes at the same time within the same within the same patient under in vivo settings. So what is the most valuable thing that you can learn by this multi isotope imaging capability? Can I answer that one, or Sarah, do you mind? Uh, yes, I, it, it is very important, and I, I will let you know why. For example, in actinium, you want to know where the daughter ends up because it depends on the carrier molecule. If the carrier molecule is not rapidly excreted, the kidney, as we know, is one of the dose-limiting organs for radionuclide therapies. So we certainly need to know the distribution, not only of the targeting molecule, but also of any daughters. And that's true also of thorium, uh, 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 radium maybe to a lesser extent, uh, because we understand its pathway. Uh, and I wanted also to point out that I agree with you totally that uh, there, certainly in small animal scanners, Lars Forenlid, who is going to present, I think this afternoon, uh, he is going to raise uh, the design of a, a system that will allow us, that has the capabilities to allow us to differentiate uh, between the different uh, daughters from resulting from these decay chain ultra emitters. Thank you. Emily, you have a comment? Right, I, I, I had a, a, a question or comment on uh, something that Dan mentioned in this presentation about, um, uh, he mentioned two things. He mentioned that sometimes the, um, the tools we're using to do imaging for radionuclear therapy are a little bit complex and they, they would need to be improved and that he would also like to see some, some better tools for combined therapy imaging uh, and dosimetry. So I wanted to ask from his uh, you know, clinician and physician standpoint, what he would like to see um, in, in new tools. Um, what tools would you like the physicists to develop for you? What would be your wish list? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I guess the, the ultimate wish list is a black box where the images go in one end and a number comes out the other end. Um, that's a bit naive, but it's gotten a lot better. Um, and I think the dosimetry challenge that the SNMI is doing right now will, I think, really help us to understand how much expertise is out there and how variant are the results, because that's something that I think um, we need to know if 10 different people get the same thing, how many different answers do you get? Um, and I think that the, the software tools to help improve both consistency as well as methodology, um, I think is super important, but is as simple as it can be for the end user so that there's not a huge barrier to starting these things, um, I think is, is really the most important thing. Um, and part of the, as I mentioned before, part of that is just having a, a user base of people that are trained to do this. And a lot of the training programs in medical physics really focus more on either imaging or external beam and, and having that pathway for people to really learn in their original training how to do radiopharmaceutical dosimetry will help. Um, and so I think it's, it's a combination of all those things we need to make, make it approachable. Would that mean that for you, something that can be single time point imaging is a priority? I think at some point that's a huge priority, but I think there's a, a lot we need to learn before we can get there. Um, I think first we need to prove that customizing a dose to some patient factors improves outcomes. Um, and I think we all accept that that should be true, but I think we need to rigorously prove it. Um, and then once we know what are the important factors, which toxicities can you reliably predict and with a good tight threshold that will work, um, I think then you can distill it down to minimum necessary data to get there. And hopefully a single time point at some convenient time will be sufficient. But I think that remains to be seen. Thank you. Uh, I, I still see a hand up, but uh, now we are behind schedule, <laughs> whereas previously we were ahead of schedule. Uh, clearly, there are very interesting discussions uh, that can continue uh, after uh, this session or even after this workshop. Uh, the workshop was meant to make connections uh, between 
uh, all of us and attendees. So uh, any, uh, if there are still questions, please type them into the QA uh, box or app or balloons at the bottom of your screen. Um, they will be forwarded to the speakers um, and hopefully this will evolve into continuing email discussions between interest, uh, in, interested people uh, with, uh, with similar interests. So uh, breaks are important in order to keep us uh, awake, uh, fed and biologically satisfied uh, so that we can come back at uh, 11.55, oh, sorry, at 1.55 in order to uh, continue with session two. I would like to thank all of the speakers. I would like to thank uh, all of the panelists who have joined us. Uh, please stay on for uh, the, the second uh, session of today's workshop. And uh, if you want to see some interesting information, keep your screen on and you can find out more about the seminar series at NCI. Um, and um, just general information about the workshop. So thank you very much, and we'll see everybody uh, uh, back soon at 155. Bye, see you later.